Welcome to the final chapter of the semester. So in this chapter we're going to be covering language and hemisphere asymmetry. So first, um, a couple basic definitions of language and speech that are going to be important. First of all, phonemes are the b most basic speech sounds and they're used to make up morphemes which are the simplest units of meaning. So some examples of morphemes are un, able, in, etc. The smallest um, sounds you can have that still have meaning. Semantics are the meaning of words or sentences. So you put the morphemes into words and then combine the words into something that means something that makes sense together. And then syntax are, is the grammatical rules for constructing phrases and sentences. So they are the rules that govern the construction of phrases and sentences. And lastly, grammar encompasses all of the rules for the usage of a language. So all of the you know English rules that you know and love, that all falls under grammar. From birth, babies are actually able to distinguish uh, phonemes, which are again the basic units of speech sounds. And they're able to understand these from any language. By age seven months though, children are paying more attention to sentences with unfamiliar structure than familiar structure, indicating that they've already learned some of the basic rules of language and are looking for exceptions. Thus, early age is a, a critical time of rapid development. Um, it's also what we truly call um, a critical time or a sensitive period. So again, as we've talked about earlier chapters, sensitive periods are periods during development in which an organism can be permanently altered by a particular experience or treatment. For language, the sensitive period appears to be roughly from birth to age six. After this time, if language has not been developed, um, as sometimes happens with extreme isolation or depri um, deprivation, language will likely not develop. There's further evidence of sensitive periods in learning a second language. If you learn a second language before age 11, you use the same parts of your brain that you use for your first language. But if you learn it after age 11, you have to use other areas of your brain that do not appear to be as adept with language. Humans aren't the only animals to show language, um, as you know. Birds have been studied not because we believe that human language developed from birds, but rather because there are some interesting similarities between human and bird language. In songbirds, the songs are only sung by the males and require a few steps. Um, first, initial exposure to a tutor. Birds also seem to have a sensitive period, and exposure to songs after this period will have no effect. Further, recordings of bird songs can be used to help train a male songbird to sing. Once the baby bird has learned the song, it will try to replicate the song and will make changes as needed. So that is the success of approximation. It keeps working toward getting the song right. And once the song has been learned and perfected, it becomes crystallized, meaning it's stored permanently. Before it is crystallized, um, before it is crystallized, hearing is very important, of course, um, and impairments in hearing would preclude the bird from learning the song. However, after crystallization, hearing is no longer important, and the bird will still seem normally with or without hearing. Researchers have used many different methods to try to show that animals, especially gorillas, can communicate and understand language. However, the question is, are they just showing associations, or does it go beyond that? Can they put words together in novel ways and make, that make sense? In other words, do they have grammar? Uh, researchers differ on the answer to this question, but I have a very good video that I'll show you, and you can be the judge. It's roughly 10 minutes, but it's very, very worth your time. So let me show you this video. That looks stupid, Mom. Not as stupid as sheep, mind you, but pigs are definitely stupid. 
Excuse me. No, we're not. Good heavens. It took high-tech models and banks of computers to make. But at its core, Babe expresses an age-old human fantasy. Talking animals. Our mom called us all the same. And what was that, dear? She, she called us all Babe. Meet Hamlet. He's a couch potato pig, aren't you? Huh? He's Hammy to his friends. And meet Hammy's best friend, psychology professor Sally Boyson. Hamlet, you want a dog biscuit? Hammy. Sit. Go further down than that. Further down to sit. There's so much lore and anecdotes around about how pigs are smart. And I don't know that we have very much empirical or scientific evidence to support that. Four years ago, Sally set out to see how smart Hamlet is. She used three different objects, each with its own sign. Ball! Ball, Hammy! Ball! Hammy, where's the ball? Good boy, Hamlet! Good boy. Eventually, Hamlet learned to associate signs with objects. But it took a laborious two years of training. By the way, during the original research, Sally was always careful to avoid the clever Hans effect. No eye movements or nods or gestures that might tip Hamlet off. Frisbee! Frisbee! Hamlet's memory's pretty good. Sally hasn't tested him for three years. But simple associations like these are his limit. He can't use the signs in any other way, and we can't see his mind at work. There's a whole lot more to naming than just associating even uh, an abstract symbol of some sort or, or a gesture with an object. Uh, he'd need to be able to use that name or that symbol in a lot of different ways to show us that he had a, a different understanding that was beyond a mere association. <laughs> We're on the California coast at Santa Cruz. Here, the animals have a little more to say than Hamlet. How many tanks do you have here? Well, we have two right here, and then there are several back there. We're going to have to use this uh, antiseptic here, this little foot bath, before we go on deck. OK. And these are the objects that she'll be working with. Uh -huh. I'm here to have a conversation with Rocky. A very friendly sea lion. Do you want a kiss? Mm -hmm. oh, all right, give me a kiss. Hey, give me a kiss. Oh, God. <laughs> Another one? Yeah, yeah, she's kind of a sloppy kisser, isn't she? <laughs> That's very nice. That feels good, Rocky. As soon as you get the OK to start ball, you turn them up like this, palm up. First, I have to learn Rocky's language, 24 signs. the outline of a ball. You go up and down? Right. Put it down. Next, the sign touch with flipper. Followed by go do it when I drop my foot. Drop the foot. Okay. <laughs> I almost went in. <laughs> so it would look something like Now here's cube. Okay. All right. And so we're gonna merge that with the action signs. So give me a flipper touch. Show me what. Okay, that's good. And tail touch. I think that's about it. Um the, the they look Decent for a first timer. Decent. And I think, uh, <laughs> high standard. Well, I, I could have. Well, said I probably have some kind of an accent. I hope she recognizes my accent. <laughs> okay, let's talk. Grab a couple of pieces of fish. <laughs> just toss them in. She knows you're going to feed her. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay, now point to your foot. Oh, there you go. All right, now we're going to give her cube flipper touch. You ready? Okay, cube. Flipper touch. Okay, she wasn't quite sure about that. <laughs> that was very Okay, good. put your she foot back. She sure up. looks cute. Rocky's not happy. <laughs> she you doesn't know what I'm that. talking about. Uh, let's do a ball tail touch. Ball tail touch. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, ball. Looking good. Rocky checks for the ball. Okay. And tail touch. Oh, no, she does ball fetch. <laughs> now, what, is this my accent that's getting her confused or what? All right, let's try again in my best signing. Okay. Ball. Okay. Tail Stop. touch. There she goes. Okay. Whoa, far out. Bravo. Very good. Very good. 
Terrific. It's an exhilarating feeling to really get through to an animal. Good, huh? Do a uh, cube flipper. Remember flipper touch. Okay? Cube. Okay. Flipper touch. Okay, very good. Now I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Football. Okay. Is it here? Rocky heads right yeah. for the yes hey, button. Bravo. Very good. It's great in show business, isn't it? <laughs> Once okay. Rocky gets used to my accent, it's obvious she really does get it. Okay. She knows, at some level at least, what my signs mean. And unlike Hamlet the pig, she can oh, use them in different great. ways. So with Rocky, there's at least a brief glimpse into an animal mind. In fact, over the years, there have been several examples of simple communication with animals. This is Washu the chimp in the late 1960s. Watch Washu make a sign meaning open. Washu was raised from infancy by researchers Alan and Beatrix Gardner who treated Washu as if she were a human child. Washu learned to use over 130 American Sign Language signs by the time she was five years old. For instance, these signs mean, Me, Washu. It was a tremendous breakthrough, and the gardeners later repeated and extended their success with four other chimps. These experiments showed that animals and humans could communicate using a human language, opening up the possibility of our probing other animals' thoughts by simply talking. Come on, what is it? Check. Good boy! The payoff of easy, two-way human-animal communication can be seen with Alex the parrot. What is it? Good boy! Yeah, That's good right! Bird. Alex can distinguish and name different objects. Nail! Nail, that's right, you're a good birdie. Tell me what color. And different colors. What color? Yellow. Yellow, that's right. He can identify different materials. What matter? What? Good yeah, boy. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Alex can count. How many? Good boy, how many? Two. Good parent. Good boy. One, two. Okay. And he can also grasp abstract concepts. Okay, can you tell me what's different? What's different? Color. In case you're wondering, these researchers are also convinced they're not falling into any clever Hans type of traps that might tip Alex off. Good boy! Alex can juggle concepts in an astonishing way. You know, what color bigger? Good boy! Good birdie! Yeah! And take a look at this. Oh, yeah, look! What matter, four corner blue? In Alex's personal language, that means what is the four cornered blue object made of? He's never been asked this question before, so this is not a circus trick. There are several four cornered objects and several blue objects, but only one that combines four corners and blue color. What matter, four corner oh, blue? Wood, that's right. I've got to go eat dinner. Alex is one of the most successful examples of an animal using human language. Be good. You be good. Through that language, he shows a grasp of abstract concepts like sameness or the idea of combining qualities. But teaching language to animals is not the only way to study how and what they think. I'm sorry. You're a good boy. The fact is, most species simply can't handle the human language. Neither their brains nor bodies are organized that way. And if animals do learn a human language, the vocabulary is limited. It can only cover a fraction of what the animal might think. So the challenge for researchers is to probe animals' minds without the aid of language. To see if somewhere in there could be ideas and concepts. That's what we'll explore for the rest of the program. I love that video because it does give you a really nice um, 
glimpse into what animals can do. You like you got to see Wasu with using um, American Sign Language. So there are a lot of different um, techniques that have been used, such as Yorkish, of um, trying to find ways to help animals communicate. But but you saw it for yourself. So think about it. Is it just an association, or are they actually, you know, taking language in an abstract way and making it their own and using language? It's debated. So uh, whatever you decide on that is about as good as what anyone else thinks on that. But it's a really interesting question.